the first day, the uh, president of the, of the dean of students gave this speech putting us in our place. He goes, just because you went to Harvard, you're not gonna be famous. He goes, how many people were famous from the class of 1896 or 1796 or 1696? No one of name. So you're the class of 1996. Get over yourself. Hi, welcome to the Black Experience Japan's Melanated Files. My name is Ranzo and the purpose of this series is to highlight the black people living in Japan. Who are they? We share their stories. Remember to find us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at the Black Experience Japan and subscribe to this channel for weekly videos on the black experience in Japan. Let's get into the interview. And my name is Henry Moreland Seals and I'm from Charleston, West Virginia, the Alumni Association of Harvard. I owe them a lot, right? I'm not going to lie. I mean, I wear the college ring right here. I owe them a lot. I think the name Harvard has opened up doors that would not be open for me. Okay. Um, and whether I work to get in there or not, people will have their opinions, but I'll explain to you what happened. So I said before, when I was eight, I told my parents I wanted to go to Harvard, because Harvard was the best school in the world, right? And so I wanted to go. And when I started going to school and studying, when studying started to get hard for me about mm, junior high school, first year of junior high school, it got hard for me. I wasn't used to working hard. Everything had come so easy to me. So I became a bad student. I mean, when you become a bad student, teachers treat you differently. And so there were two years, my seventh grade and eighth grade year, where I just didn't care. Someone seemed to respect me. It seemed like I was never going to get it. I was in that awkward phase. Girls didn't like me. I don't know if they like me now, but I mean, I was that whole phase. I mean, the awkwardness and the challenges studying and then I didn't piece it together. People started treating me differently. Teachers started treating me differently with less respect. And I was like, what's going on? And my father, I had noticed that my father was, would pay my older brother for grades, right? Not at that time, because my older brother's seven years older than me, but I remember that. And I was like, I'm really not motivated, but I do want to buy comic books and things. So I said to my dad, would you pay me if I got better grades. Now, I started doing a little better at the end of eighth grade, but I wasn't doing well enough. I said to my dad, would you pay me if I got straight A's? Would you pay me? And he goes, you know what? I'll pay you $50 if you get straight A's, right? So this would, my ninth grade year would be freshman year of high school in certain states, but senior year or whatever, junior high school, my ninth grade year. My mother had graduated from college in 88 and went to move to Virginia to find work. So we lived with, I lived with my father for that time in the beginning of the year. I started playing football. I played track before I started playing football, started being more active. I said, I have to change my mindset. I have to somehow just do something because I just didn't know how to get to where I needed to go. So I tried everything. So I started playing football. I was more active in student council. I started doing quiz bowl stuff and things of that nature. But anyway, about studying, I studied my ass off. I would come home after football practice. I would study for hours. I'd sit there. I'd read the chapter, right, that I needed to study. Like, like, I knew the history test was two weeks from now, but I'd read the whole chapter, and I'd read it twice in a night. I'd do my homework twice in a night. I'd read ahead. I was literally, I remember one time I had a, I worked in a comic book shop, so sometimes I'd get hangnails, and the paper and all the dust would infect my hangnail. I'd have alcohol, rubbing alcohol and peroxide, have my finger sitting in it, because I may have got it also infected in football practice, and I'm reading my homework, right? Sitting there at this art table, because I wanted to be an artist at one point, so I had this art desk and I was sitting there. And I got straight A's, and my teachers were shocked. I was shocked. I was like, wow, I did it. And I said to my father, look at this. And he's like, but can you do it for a semester? And I'm like, is this man really gonna pay me, <laughs> right? But teachers treated me different. The kids at school treated me differently. You know, everyone always said I was smart, but I was showing it now. And I realized that if I show it, then people treat you differently. It's not about what you say you are, it's about what you do. I learned this, you know, so there's my faith. I know I have to do something for other people, or at least show what I am, not just tell people. Um, so I studied. So then um, in the middle of that year, my mother got a job uh, working for, as a secretary, working at a cardio cardiologist's office. And that was kind of cool. But she, she got the job. We moved with her in the middle of the year. I wind up in a high school and I'm sitting there in the, the counselor's office and the counselor's saying, what kind of classes do you want to take? Do you want to take honors classes where kids are going to college or Z, Z level or Y level and all these different levels? And I'm like, well, I got straight A's. I'm going to honors. I'm going to Harvard. She looked at me and she's like, okay. She goes, but I think it might be hard for you. you know, your school was a different school. You know, she was 
saying this school was really hard and everything and whatever. And I'm sitting there going, she doesn't believe in me. Why? What's going on? My mother thinks it's racial. I probably think it was to a degree too because I was a different kind of kid, I think. I, didn't ra I wasn't raised in the South, like Virginia or it was West Virginia. It's a little different. So I wasn't used to people just telling me I couldn't do something. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? But this lady was telling me I couldn't do it. She goes, you know what? If you want to take honors, take it. But if it's hard, you come back to me. So I go to this class. I go to my first class of the day and it's American history. Now I was taking American history in West Virginia, but in Virginia, or this school I went to, American history was taken by juniors in high school. So kids who were two years older than me. And this was probably the hardest class in the school. So I get there that day, they're doing a test on civil war. I'm there for the test. The teacher, I learned later, Miss Rooster is a great lady. She, she, we're friends, we became friends and I, I, I like her a lot. I still do, hi Miss Rooster. Um, she um, didn't like me in the class. She wrote this in my college recommendation too. She didn't like me in the class, having a freshman in her class that was from West Virginia and insulted her, right? She gave me the test. The test was the hardest test I'd ever seen. I said, what is this? Is that a map of the South? And where did McKellen or McClellan go and everything? I was like, oh, you had to write an essay. I'd never written an essay like she wanted it. I was, I was thinking, this is hard. So I did the test. The next day or whatever, when I got the test back, there was a note on it saying, I'm not sure if you belong in this class. You should reconsider being in this class. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So I did my studying. I did my studying and I studied and I studied. The next test, I got the highest grade in the class. The highest grade. And she actually said to the class, she goes, I would like to, you know, she would give an award for the highest grade. She goes, I'd like to announce the highest grade in the class. I think it was a 98 or 96. I think I still had the test. So these juniors looked at me like, this kid can do it, right? So I took it upon myself to realize that it's not us about grades. So I got involved in student council, I got involved in volunteering, I got involved in academic you know, quiz bowl and all these different things. And you know, just to meet people, just to build up my resume like all college kids, you know, kids do. But I took the PSATs and I started getting these letters from schools and I told my mother, I'm just applying to Harvard. That's the only school I wanna to go to. She's like, apply to different schools. I'm like, but mom, if I have an out, I'm going to give up. So I applied to Harvard. I applied to Princeton. I had went to William and Mary for summer camp. So they, I applied to them as well. Um, my safe school was William and Mary, uh, the college of William and Mary. I think I might've applied to University of Richmond and I applied to the, to army. I applied to army, but in the middle of that, I said, you know, I'm not really, my heart's not really in it. So when they wanted to do the physical test and stuff like that, I, I just decided not to do it because I thought I was really going to get in the way of someone who really wanted to serve their country in the, in the military. And I think one of the first black graduates from Army actually called me on the phone because they had seen my scores or whatever. And he called me, I was touched. He goes, do you know who I am, son? I'm like, no, sir, who are you? And he introduced himself. So school started contacting me and I said to myself, I'm not the best athlete. So I started, I told my college, not college, high school football coach, I said, can you, give me some film, I wanna to go to Harvard. So he got an article for me in the newspaper. This is a, he was from um, Arme Armenian descent, Coach Occasion. He got me an article in the newspaper to help me out. And these people from different races were helping me do this, right? Helping me, I, I got a job at a country club, serving tables and stuff like that. And I meet these people who would never have me in the club, but you know, I was serving them water and stuff and they, their kids knew me. And so they would talk to me or I would see them at school functions. And so they wanted to help me. So it was like everyone was trying to help me. I'd be in, I got like the president scholarship at Hamlin University in, in, in Minnesota. I never thought about applying there, but they contacted me and said, we really want you. So I went there, I got the scholarship and the, 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 the fellow who was the, the guidance counselor said to you, he goes, I know you're applying to Harvard and you probably get Harvard, you won't choose us, but they really liked you. And I think one of the reasons was um, when I interviewed, they asked me all these questions and I go in there being nice and speaking all, saying all the right things, but they asked me, if you could be a famous athlete or a famous academic, which would it be? And I said, hands down, a famous athlete. And they're like, why? I said, because the way the world works, I would get so much media attention, I could make a difference. I could get a message out there. That's why, and I was honest about it. And I think there's something about being genuine that, that I think helped, right? Now, being black helped? I think so. I think it helped a lot. I mean, 
you know, schools are looking for diversity. You know, I know this. Um, and I knew that perhaps pe parents would say things. People are going to say things, but I tell you something. I don't think there's anyone who's ever met me. Now, I don't go telling people I went to Harvard when I meet them. But when it comes up, I don't think there's any person who's ever met me who said he didn't belong there, right? And if they did, I don't care, you know? I mean, I want them to, I don't live my life for those other people, but you know, I can't go around thinking, was it affirmative action, was it this, was it that? I just have to believe in myself. And I think the results of you know, meeting people, when they find out later on, you know, uh, that I went to Harvard, they see it online, they're like, oh, I get it now. You know, um, I interviewed kids who want, to, I did interviewing for a while for kids who want to go to Harvard here in Japan, I'd interview them. And they were great kids. All of them are brilliant, intelligent, and do they belong at Harvard from an academic standpoint? Yeah, yeah, they do. And from a personality standpoint, perhaps, but it's but so many spots, right? And schools want people, you know, some people who are brainy, some who are communicators, some who are people people, some who are volunteer types, some who are, you know, alphas and betas. And so they're trying to get a mix there because these kids are gonna go out into the world and make a name for the college and bring money back to the college. So you want to spread that out. I know that from HR, that's what you do. You don't hire one type of person. And it's not about affirmative action. It's not about, I need some Japanese and some foreigners. You know that the more people you get who are diverse, right? And I'm not, and the term diversity didn't exist when I was, at least not to me when I was working in HR, but you just intuitively say, okay, you have a couple kids who are brainy. I mean, every superhero story, every fantasy tale, diversity is there. It's there. You have Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel. It's, it's there, you, you, you just know intuitively, it will make your team best to have different types of people. Race is a very loaded thing, so I can't tell someone, definitely, someone didn't look at me and say, you are black, therefore you're good, you know, someone didn't think, this kid's black, let's give him an opportunity. But I was from Virginia, I was from the South, I was applying from the South as a black kid, and I knew that not many apply from the South. I knew how many people applied from West Virginia, because I looked it up, I, the information is readily accessible, and I thought I had a better chance if I was in West Virginia, because I knew how many people applied from West Virginia and how many people um, uh, didn't, uh, you applied from other different states and got in, et cetera. But a lot of the students I went to school with were from Boston, they were from Massachusetts. So Harvard, hire, not hires, but gets a lot of kids from New York and Boston and Massachusetts. I think maybe they get benefits, by hiring, you know, recruiting enough kids from in-state, I don't know. That can be looked at as affirmative action in a way, you know, but a quota system in a way. So there's, there's other things going on I'm not aware of. I guess what I have to say is there is there's things going on, but all you can do is prepare yourself, go in there, give people a reason to want to buy into you. And that goes from just, I just like people. I just like getting to know people interviewing me and talking to me, and I think it helped. So. Um, but getting there when I was there, I realized not everyone was like me. I thought everyone would be like me, you know, like people, like the world, want to help everybody. And everyone's there for different reasons. Does that let me down? I was like, oh, I had this grandiose image and it wasn't what it was. Um, so that, that hurt. Um, when I wanted to come to Japan, most of my friends were like, why do you want to go leave Harvard? This is the greatest place. Why would you want to leave? But most of us weren't happy there. Not because Harvard's a bad place, but we're college students. You know, we're going through growth and all these challenges. So we all weren't really happy, but that's what we knew. So a lot of kids didn't want to leave. That shocked me. Um, but it was like college, like anywhere else. The first couple of weeks, all of us were like, do we belong here? Do we belong here? Everyone, regardless of race, was like, do I, me? But once you get there, you meet everyone, you realize, not only do I belong there, but even more people belong. Unfortunately, they can only, they only recruit but so many. So, but I know I, oh, dude, man, I did everything and talked to everyone and got every, I mean, I worked it. But the thing was, <laughs> I was, I got the application, application for Harvard when I was a freshman in high school. I wanted it that much. I, I emailed them, I emailed them, I sent a letter to get it. And they said, you know, you can't apply until you're a senior. I didn't know that. I didn't know anything about the system. I was like, oh, okay. But I got the application form I, and I looked at it and I read it and I looked at the essays and stuff like that. I did that every year. Um, and at one point it got out in my school. I think I was a junior. Some, some kid, someone, someone interpreted that my application or I was getting applications meant I was accepted. So one day a kid said to me at school, heard you got accepted to Harvard. And my younger brother was with me, and we tell this story every now and then. And he, they said, and I didn't say no. I said, yeah, yeah, I did. 
And so all the parents and some people knew and assumed I was in already. So I said to my brother later on that day, I said, I have to go. I have no choice. I have to do this. Could you imagine what I would feel like if I didn't? And uh, <laughs> dude, that year, I mean, I, I, yeah, I worked it. So, you know. Yeah, the only school I didn't get into was University of Richmond. Right, so I applied to Princeton, got into Princeton, applied to Harvard, got into Harvard, applied to William and Mary, got in there, Hamlin, I got there. Um, and the one I didn't get to was R University of Richmond because they wanted my original SATs. My original SATs sent by, uh, from the school board rather than a copy that I send to them. But I didn't have an extra $50 to send to University of Richmond, which I didn't want to go to. Uh, so I just didn't give it to them. I sent them the copy and they were just like, sorry, we can't accept your application. So that's what happened with the University of Richmond. So I got those, I gave copies to my friends. I put copies in my classroom, I gave them to my teachers who I, like Mr. Dexter and Ms. Rusher, I gave them copies saying, thank you. You know, you guys helped me. When I got the letter, I remember that day, my girlfriend was at my home, it came in the mail. I had sort of known beforehand because my teacher, my, not my teacher, my counselor, guidance counselor, had been contacting the school because I wanted to go, right? And the, and, and the school, when I went to go, I was interviewed there as well. And one of the, um, uh, the um, ad, ad, admissions officers, a senior man said, your chances are really good, son. You know, he said this to me. He says, I can't guarantee anything, but your chances are really good. So in my brain, I was like, I'm going, you know? I was like, I had to convince myself because if I didn't, I mean, I was so scared I wasn't going to get in. So when I got the letter, actually, I got, my, my counselor came to my room, came to my classroom about a week before the beginning of April and said, I need to speak to you. And I went out in the hallway and she goes, I think you're in. I've been calling admissions. They've sort of implied you're in. And I'm like, really? Really? What did you do? But she was hounding them. She was like, this kid, this kid. She was hounding them. Miss Johnson, God bless her soul. Um, and the, uh, when the letter came, my girlfriend was at my house. I said, my younger brother was at play practice. He was in high school with me. He was a freshman when I was a senior. I went to his school to tell him and tell my teachers. And they let me, they were doing like a curtain call, like doing a dress rehearsal. And when they found out, they said, when the state, when the curtain opens, I want you to be standing in the middle of the stage, Henry. And I was like, okay. And I had my acceptance paper and I was like, yes, I did this, right? So um, that, was, that was a contribution. A lot of people from different backgrounds bought into this kid and helped me get in there. You know, Mr. Hesbach wrote a recommendation, um, Ms. Ruscher, Mr. Dexter, Mr. Gill, who was a, a judge who I had, he had seen me at a, um, um, what do you call it, a mock trial program I was doing. I was doing like mock trials and, I, and he saw me and I saw him at the country club. I didn't know he was a member. I was serving, serving him water at the country club and I said, he goes, son, I, I remember you. I'm like, yeah, Mr. Gill, uh, Judge Gill, how are you? And I said, by the way, would you mind writing me a, a recommendation to college? So. I asked everybody. I wanted them to see who I was. And about the LA riots, the reason I mentioned Mr. Dexter um, is uh, when the LA riots happened, me being this positive guy about, you know, the world can be a better place, I can make a difference, it broke me. I said, this guy, you know, um, Rodney King is being beaten on video and these cops can get off. As a young man, this is my first real exposure to the world can be unfair or it's not for me or whatever. I felt really angry. I mean, so angry. And I felt, a, it's like a Liam Neeson moment. You're feeling a racism in your heart, right? Towards white people. And it's, it's, it was weird, but I felt that. Cause remember that whole, I said before about being, you know, sabotaged by what the world does to you sometimes. And I was so angry. I went to school the next morning saying, I'm just gonna throw it away. The world, I could work hard forever and go to Harvard and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I'm still gonna get, beat up and no one's going to defend me. I was so broken that I wanted to go and just beat someone, you know. I, I, was, I was broken and instead a part of me, a part of my brain said, Henry, you know better. You know white people aren't evil, you know. You know, you know, you don't, you know this, right? Um, at least you believe this. Uh, so I went to the teacher's lounge and I didn't go into the teacher's lounge, but I stood outside of it and I said, if Mr. Dexter comes out, Mr. Dexter was my, was my, my teacher and he was, he uh, looks like Jesus at the time, but he was kind of open. He looked like kind of a guy who might've been a hippie back in the days. He was very liberal and everything. And I, I trusted him. I trusted him. My, uh, one of my God, my, my godfather, who was my English teacher as a freshman in high school, he wasn't around. He was in a different school. So I said, if Mr. Dexter comes out 
and he, he can give me hope. I will do my best. And he came out of that room and I looked at him, I said, Mr. Dexter, I said, what am I going to do? What does this mean for me? I said, what? And he's like, Henry, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can say, you know? And I just put my head in his chest and he hugged me and he goes, but all I can say is you've got to try. And if anyone can do it, it's you. And I was like, if this, there's got to be more people like him in the world, right? I said, you know what? I'm going to try. I know from, it, it, re, it reaffirmed my faith, right? In people. And I've had that reaffirmed consistently, you know, throughout. Uh, so I had that moment. So even though I don't, so the reason I'm sharing that is it wasn't like all bright eyed and like, ah, the world's great. I mean, the world is constantly trying to bring you down. And if you let it, it will. It'll do it. And uh, I got to thank a whole bunch of people for keeping me, you know, grounded. So, uh, yeah, kudos to him. Kudos to him. Yeah, and Miss Rusher and all those people who helped me. And Miss Johnson, she's black. Miss Johnson helped me get in there. So a lot of people, a lot of people. It's like any college. It was, I mean, but it has this Harvard thing. So the thing that was really cool about Harvard, the thing that was great about it, okay, there's a lot of things great about it. It has a lot of money. So for instance, they were giving away, they were giving money to students who from the South, regardless of need, for like winter clothes, right? Um, I played on the football team freshman year. And if I needed goggles, they'd buy them for me. I mean, there was, there's so much money at that school. It was like, it was, you felt like you were in a country club. Food was great, the dorms were great, it was nice. Um, but the culture, the first week though, what was great about it though wasn't that, what was great about it was the first day, the uh, president of the, of the Dean of Students gave this speech putting us in our place. He goes, just because you went to Harvard, you're not gonna be famous. He goes, how many people were famous from the class of 1896 or 1796 or 1696? No one of name. So you're the class of 1996, get over yourself. <laughs> I was like, yes, you know, I was like, I need that because my head is up here, right? So, and you see people from all different walks there. And I think that grounds you. So people who are grounded will be grounded. People who are not will not. But, um, you know, you, it's just like any other place. You meet some kids who are really smart and some of them work out, some of them self-destruct. You see people who aren't very smart who do well, you know. You, I, work, I went to school with some guys, I'm like, how did they get in here? But, We've all gone through it, We've all, we're all there. When I went to visit, okay, let me just give you a story. I, when I went to visit, as a, as a, before I got accepted, you know, if you're in, you can visit the school. So I stayed with some kids in the dorm and there was a black guy, white guy, they were in the dorms, they were, they were, they were in a mixed dorm, so they were integrated. So I saw these guys, I was thinking, well, well, they're integrated here, you know, it's not just all the black dorms or the white dorms. But I went to the Black Student Association, they had, Khalid Muhammad or something, I can't remember, or, or Conrad Muhammad, anyway, I think it was Khalid, I can't remember. Something, the, uh, it wasn't Elijah Muhammad, but anyway, the, the Nation of Islam was giving a talk in the university, invited by these groups and stuff, and I looked around in this auditorium and there were white kids, black kids, Jewish kids, Middle Easterns, etc., listening to this man spew, not spew, but speak about the Nation of Islam and talk about, you know, the white devil and all that kind of stuff, people listening, and I'm like, okay, this is an idea that is offending to some people, but people are sitting and listening. That impressed me. I was like, wow. You know, that's the kind of world you want to live in is where people can say things that are offensive, but you listen. You give them the, res if they don't disrespect you by coming at you with a bat and they're just sharing ideas, let them. And you're trying to listen to the ideas, not because you believe them, but it's also good to know your enemy <laughs> sometimes, right? Just to, to know what's out there in the world. That, that really impressed me. And I went to the Black Students, I went to Black Student Association organ meetings and stuff, or a meeting there, and I went to the, the, the student union and all that kind of thing, and it was cool. When I got there and I joined the BSA, there were, in my class, there were like 20 black men and 90 black women, right? Which is great odds for a brother, I guess, you know, if you're looking to date. But, um, you know, we were in the Black Student Association and I felt, oh, okay, even at Harvard, we've got to be on our guard, you know, the, the specter of race is there, et cetera. So, but, you know, occasionally some professor would spew something weird or write a book like The Bell Curve and, you know, racism is such a, race is such a, a, a heated topic in America. It's such a, it's, a it's, it's, it's the story of America in a way that it would come up, but I didn't have people fit in. I didn't have people 
flogging me or attacking me, you know. I, I never had the cops at Harvard bother me, you know. I mean, shoot. I remember one time my dorm held this drinking party, my freshman dorm drinking party, and me being me, my floor was the floor people would run to. We weren't drinking on my floor. So you run if the cops came, right? The cops came, confiscated the alcohol, put it next to the dorm, then drove away, and then the party started again. So we knew we were special. They treated us differently. But when I go off campus into Boston, it was a different story. So um, at Harvard, I felt special. I felt special, but I felt grounded, but I also felt special. And I wanted, I want other people to feel special, right? So, you know, if anyone want to come into the dorm and eat food with us or whatever and invite them. Some of our professors had never even eaten in the dorms. So I'd ask the professor, he's passed away, but I'd say, you want to eat in our dorm? And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, come, you know. And my, my uh, symphony professor, we're in this huge symphony hall, he's speaking. And I said to my roommate, I'm going to invite him to dinner. He goes, you want to invite the professor to dinner? I said, yeah. So I went down, his name was Reinhold Brinkmann. Reinhold, I remember his name. And I said, would you like to have dinner with us, Mr. Br professor Brinkman? He's like, sure. So he came and sat in our student union and had dinner with us. And that was cool. And I've sat and had dinner with Ezra Vogel and these people who, relatively down to earth people. Um, Peter K. Bowl, all these professors. Yeah, they were good people. They were good people, at least as far as conversation was concerned. Don't know about their politics, but it was cool. It was nice. I, I really can't complain about it. Uh, like Harvard is specifically negative or bad. It's just the world. You know, you have your bad days and your good ones. I mean, there were things like finals clubs, you know, there are like these old clubs that, you know, unless you were in a, you know, came from a certain family or you're in a certain acapella group or something, you couldn't be a member of, those type of things. But I never felt, and some certain dorms have history. So you go into that dorm, you're like, ooh, these kids all know each other. They come, their grandparents went here. So there are places where you feel marginalized, but I don't think that's any different in the world. But as a, as a college student, it's maybe your first exposure to that. So you think Harvard is, but when you go out in the world, you realize it's not just Harvard. The whole world is that way. There's cliques and groups and stuff. So all, all being at Harvard is great. I mean, when someone hears it, they change. I remember before I was telling you, like if you bow to someone, they have to bow back to you, right? People here I'm from Harvard, it doesn't mean they like me. I'm not assuming that they think I'm great or, or that they should, they shouldn't. But it does have an impact, right? But I don't tell people, you know, it's not who I am. It's just a place I went to school, right? So, but it comes up and they're like, ooh. Because their impression is that that place is for special people. Maybe this guy's got something we want. So I find that's what's happening. When I tell them that, subconsciously, it's like this guy has something we might want. And I know that for companies, you know, having someone on the board who went to Harvard looks good, right? You know, and that's great. But I got to tell you, it's, um, yeah, it, opened, it obviously opens doors, I assume. I can't prove it, but I have a feeling it did. It did. Um, Japanese are always like, habado this. I mean, I think it's helped even when I was dating, you know, if I meet a father whose daughter maybe never dated a foreigner, he went to Harvard. So he's like, oh, he's special. It helps. It helped. I have no doubt it probably helped a great deal. I think one of the things about finding a job or when you're looking for a job, you kind of feel powerless because your, your future, you know, your financial safety is sort of in the hands of somebody else. You know, your review, you're being evaluated and you may feel a little powerless. So I want to give people a little bit of power, give them a little bit of information about what's going on, usually when they submit their CV. So when you're at least for hiring managers or companies that you want to work for, right? They're thinking of a lot of different things when it comes to a CV. It's not just skills. You know, a company is in a particular situation. They're trying to hire certain types of people to fulfill a certain type of values, you know, some value for their company. Um, meaning, you know, truth, justice, those type of values is what I mean. Or they have some sort of goal in, in mind or they have a culture they're trying to cultivate. So when a hiring manager is looking for someone, they're actually looking for not just the skill set, but does the person have experience working in large teams or does the person have experience dealing with adversity, et cetera. So there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes. And so a lot of times I'll look at CVs of people, for instance, I'm hiring right now for an HR person, right? And I have a lot of CVs and I pretty much think we know who we want to hire, but looking at the CVs, everyone's qualified as far as HR experience is concerned. But looking at the CV, you sort of get a feeling that this person's focus will be too much on X or too little on Y. And you can't interview everybody, there's not enough time. So you have to look at the paper and make a decision. So a lot of times it's not personal, it's not anything like that. It's more along the lines I'm looking for someone or a company's looking for someone to fulfill a certain, to, to help develop a certain type of culture. And so at that level, the CV is immediately just sort of disregarded. 
Um, so that's what's happening a lot of times in the company level, at, at the, what's happening with the company. But then when you submit your CV and you interview with someone, it's the same thing. They're looking at you with regards to the, the culture of the company, uh, what skill sets do you have beyond the technical ones. One of the challenges a lot of companies face is to solve a problem in front of them, they'll hire a technician, someone who has the experience, right? And the problem happens is companies grow, companies change, and you need someone with, let's say, managerial skills or someone who can communicate, you know, not just do a job, but communicate and understand other contexts, other things quickly, grab things quickly. So as you interview the person, you realize, ooh, maybe they're just a little too focused on the job for instance, or their people skills may not be as developed as you may need. So there's a lot of other things going on other than that. So that's what's going on. So just know that that's the environment you're going in. They're looking for a culture fit. They're looking for a whole bunch of things. And my advice to someone when you're interviewing or you're sending out your CV is not so much to explain yourself, but to ask questions to the company you're interviewing with. You, you, you email them and you say, you know what, um, I heard you had this job opening, uh, here's my CV. If you don't mind, could you share with me what your challenges are, what your company values are, what you're trying to accomplish? Uh, not really so much what they're looking for in the role, but ask them about their problems. One, you'll learn some information. Two, that rarely happens, so you'll make an impact. Say, wait, they're asking us about me. And people love it when you ask about them. So that's one other thing. So that's just a bit of information to help you find the job. Now not find the job, but interview and get the job or get an interview. The other thing you have to face when you're looking for a job is how do you even find where the jobs are at? So I received, at, based on the, the interview you did with me before, I got a lot of questions about, you know, how do I even find jobs in Japan? And that's, that's not so easy to answer because there's so many different ways of doing it. Um, I guess if I was giving someone advice on what to do is to meet people get into a network sessions, find like your Japanese chamber of commerce or some Japanese group in your city and just meet people. Um, don't go looking for a job because most people that I have hired, let's say, because I like them or I got to know them, wasn't because they asked for a job. It's because I knew them, I trusted them, I got to know them. You know, and of course, getting to know someone, you get to understand their skills and then you just offer them a job. You know, I'll, I'll have a problem and I'm like, you know what? I remember talking to so-and-so and I got to know them and maybe they can solve a problem for me. And then you find someone, you, you talk to that person and you hire them. So it's really about that engagement. Someone trusts you, someone gets to know you because if you go saying, okay, I'm at a networking session, my name is Bob, I'm looking for a job. People, they don't realize it, but subconsciously they put walls up. This person wants something from me, you know, to make this kind of funny. Any man who's tried to pick up a woman in a bar who's, who's, who has the wherewithal, to, to, you know, who has game, let's put it that way, knows that if you approach a woman and say, I want this from you, with that kind of approach, you know, a smart woman or any woman you want to be around is going to put walls up and say, this guy, you know, and protect themselves. So that's what people do when they think you're going, you want something from them. You know, they, that's what they do. So that's just my advice regarding how to find a job. So those people who are in the States right now, you know, find a Japan group. Um, if you visit Japan, you know, attend a, a networking session for a group, you know, Black Professionals Tokyo or, you know, develop, development meetups if you're a programmer or finance meetups, those type of things. And just get to know people. Get some business cards, email those people and say, you know, it was great meeting you, et cetera. Don't even ask for the job. Just say, you know, if you ever have time, I'd like to talk with you or I'd like to catch up with you again and show interest in them. Because rarely in these networking sessions, do you meet people who aren't just talking about themselves? And so you will make a difference because if, as I said before, one of the most powerful things you can give to someone is recognition. And we don't get that during the day. I think today, how many times did someone ask me how I was today? David over there, <laughs> maybe, you know, he's the only one, he's my friend. So, um, but rarely do people ask you. And when people ask you it, it, and they mean it, 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 it really has an effect on you, whether you're aware of it or not. So showing interest in others, sincere interest in others will, find, will get you so many open doors. So that's just my advice if you're looking for work. I'm glad you asked me because people, uh, there's, a, there's a young man, 
I was gonna make a video for him who texted me and asked me that specific question. He had actually, he's even spoken to recruiters here and he's gone to websites that's like Guy Gene Pot and there's you know recruiters like Robert Walters, Robert Half, RGF, all these companies you can email and, and, and uh, post your CVs and et cetera. But the problem you find is it's easier to place someone who's close. So let's put it this way, in the, the levels of easiest to place. You know, a recruiter's job is to get commissioned and they have to get commissioned quickly because they're being judged every quarter. So the easier someone is to place, the, the, the easier they are to place. So if you're someone who doesn't speak Japanese, who's not Japanese, who's not here, those are just things that work against you, right? Unless, of course, the manager of that company or something knows you and asks for you specifically or something like that. So um, posting everywhere works, you know, posting on those places I mentioned to you before, going to recruiters' websites, um, going to company websites and posting yourself. But being here helps. Speaking Japanese helps uh, because, I mean, you're we working in Japan. That's a skill, right? The, the people who have more skills are more marketable, so to speak. Um, but even without the Japanese, you know, a lot of times, like there's this, there's this fellow I know who's in HR. He's in New York. He's gonna know I'm talking about him if he watches this video, but I like him. I'm not gonna say his name, but he's a, he's a brother. He's in New York and I like him. I really like him a lot. He's just a great guy. But how I met him was, I just met him. Uh, he came to Black Professionals in Japan. He was here with his, with his fiance for a while and we got to know each other. Just got to know him. Just smoke a cigar, talked about once every couple of weeks got to know him. The moment I was told I needed to, I could hire someone to help me in HR with diversity, et cetera, I thought of him. We interviewed him. And can he do the job or not? I have no evidence of this. I've never worked with him, but I got him, you know, I trusted him. It's not even about like, I looked at him as, you know, the personality skills, the things he's shown on his resume, the way he communicated with me personally. I want to, I want him. You know, I don't want him to work with me. And when I find the budget and the time, I'm going to find another way for that to happen. So if you're in Japan, and he was only in Japan temporarily, now he's gone back, but he has someone in Japan who's always going to be his advocate, right? So for those of you who are looking to come into Japan, when you get here, meet people. And don't even ask for a job. Just get to, get, let them get to know you, you get to know them, and you'll have someone sitting here in Japan who's your advocate. And when there is an opportunity, they'll reach out to you. So that's... Uh, I think a surefire way to get a role is really have that person or someone who has the influence buy into you. And that just comes from buying into them. You know, I like people who like me. So, you know, I'm going to do, go the extra mile for people who I feel are sincere and genuine. And I think all of us are that way. I don't know. Let me tell you my experience, what happened. And I didn't mention this the last time. So when I was interviewing to come to Japan, I interviewed with several companies, right? I only got one of those. So regardless of where I went to school, hey, there wasn't a lot of companies just throwing deals at me. So I interviewed with Panasonic, I interviewed with Hitachi, I interviewed with a lot of uh, consulting companies like um, back in the day McKinsey and Monitor and those kind of companies thinking they could get me to Japan. Uh, and I interviewed with a company called Mitani, that, where I wound up eventually. And when I was interviewing, I thought, you know, I went to Harvard, my grades are okay, you know, I speak Japanese, I'm going to get a job, right? Just totally thought I'd get a job, but I didn't. Some of my colleagues at school did, and I don't know the reason. One of my friends was black and he got a job and I didn't, so I don't think it was racial, you know? Um, but I think it came down to just where they thought I was a cultural fit for the role, you know? Um, I really don't know what it was. So in that perspective, I'm like, was it my language? No, because I spoke language better than some of the people who got jobs. Uh, but I spoke worse than others, right? Yeah, they might have been studying economics or something. Could be. I will never know. I really will never know. So it could have been that. Some of them may have been studying economics or social sciences, things they thought were maybe more applicable to the job. That's possibly true. I never, in 25 years, I never thought of that, ever. So, um, but... So I really can't tell you. So the reason I'm telling you this is because even from my perspective, meaning I've had the experience of going into interviews and not knowing what's going on. So if you go into an interview or you're going through this process and you feel a little lost or you feel like what's going on, it happens to all of us, right? And you can overcome that is what I, I guess the message there. But as far as me being in HR and knowing people who work in HR and saying what's the most important thing, um, a lot of it is intelligence being able to, not just intelligence like your smartness, but also emotional intelligence, reading the room, you know, reading the people you're interviewing. Like, um, 
I was interviewing a person for, the, for this company. They got the job, even though I wasn't their strongest advocate, right? I'm not the person who makes the final decision. The hiring manager, myself, we all discuss. But I was sitting with this person trying to be, what's the term? We were hiring them for a senior role. And I want our senior managers to be genuine people, you know, not acting, not putting on airs like I'm a manager. And, you know, we need some personability in them. And I met this person, tell me about yourself. And I tried really hard to let them know, just be real with me. And they, all their answers were kind of canned and they were like, very good question. You know, I'm thinking, I'm like, you, I'm thinking this person is not telling me the truth. They're not lying, but they don't get it. They're not reading me, right? If they could have read me a little better, they could have sold themselves a little better to me. I said, this guy's trying to get me, but I think he was worried, you know, maybe nervous or whatever. And the hiring manager for the person said, Henry, you know, the way you interview sometimes can take people, can, can shock people sometimes. So I'm trying to get out of them, but I don't do it to everybody. Just these are people who are senior leaders. I want them to be people that their staff can trust and buy into. So I, I test them for that. But it, person, being able to read the room like a good comedian can read the room or a good speaker can read the room. That's key because you're gonna you're gonna be in a company. You're gonna be maybe leading people. You need to be able to read them, right? So that emotional intelligence is key. Skills, of course, because the the people who you report to rely on you to be the technical expert. So having a techno expertise in what you're doing is same thing about a good speaker will speak on what they know. Like I'm not speaking about tap dancing because I don't know tap dancing. So you interview for the things you believe you can do. The things you know well is what you should be interviewing for. Um, that could be an English teacher, but you don't want to be one. But if you're good at that and you're good at teaching, then you should take a job teaching because you're going to excel at it. And someone's going to see that, right? Um, and they may find you and they may want to bring you over. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people good at doing a job and they're not good at it, but I see what they're good at and you put them towards doing that and they just excel or someone who's being an English teacher but they have really strong communication skills and they get a job you know as a recruiter or they get a job in HR or they get a job as a developer because they have these skills that they're using it's not their job but they're using it in their job someone sees that someone sees the value needs that value and brings it on so the genuineness doing what you love even if it's only as a hobby, somehow doing what you love so people can see you doing that, that'll make you attractive. It's like you want to be at your best. You want to be your prettiest at all times. You're, you're at your prettiest when you're in your zone. So finding your zone and having people see you in your zone is also a, a, a real way of getting noticed is key. It's a toss up. I really don't know. I've worked at companies where, I worked at companies, now I wasn't always in HR at those companies. So I've only been in HR for about 10 years. So. When I got into HR, one company I worked for, I would find that the foreign applicants, HR would say, would not want to, you know, HR got a foreign applicant directly, let's say. They were reluctant to forward it. They were like, well, I don't know there'll be a cultural fit. They found all these reasons. And this was a foreign business, but, you know, the Japanese were kind of reluctant because I think they were worried. What if the person doesn't fit, you know, or they don't have any experience sort of bringing on foreigners into a company. So I don't think it's necessarily active racism. Maybe it was for some of them, but it's along the lines of like, woo. So I think if your HR team or your company, it's not so much Japanese, but if that company isn't comfortable with foreigners or that company isn't comfortable with diversity, you don't know. So I mean, companies like Rakuten will hire foreigners, right? Companies like Line will hire foreigners. A lot of companies will hire foreigners. But it really depends on the company, depends on the leadership in that company. And one way of figuring that out is if you're looking for a job, and I said before in the beginning, you know, you interview some, you, you're sending out your resume, you ask the company about their company. What are your challenges? What are you doing? I'd like to know because I'd like to be able to help, right? Not that I'm looking for a job, but I want to help you. That's a good approach to take. So you can figure out by asking the questions, they come back to you and they give you a good explanation and it talks about stuff, you think, okay, well, this company is open to me. But if they don't respond, then you know that company, or at least somebody in it, isn't necessarily open to you. But it's a toss up. I've seen people get jobs at very domestic companies as foreigners and some people who don't. So I, I really can't generalize. Pointers. <laughs> well, 
Um, I'll use an analogy. It's like if you want to be a really good runner, you have to run. You have to train, you have to exercise. So you have to just get out there and use the language. You have to force yourself. It's like getting up in the morning to work out. You have to do the work. You have to put the work in, unless you're just gifted with languages. But you put the work in, put yourself in an environment where you have to use Japanese. You won't want to, but the results will be there. You go to a, a, a meeting or a meetup or you, you go to a, um, a party with your Japanese colleagues or you go to lunch with Japanese coworkers or you watch Japanese TV. Put yourself in an environment where you have to hear Japanese, even when you don't want to, right? So that's fundamentals. So the fundamentals of language are the same with fundamentals of learning a skill or any trade. You have to just put in the time. Um, as far as shortcuts, um, comics help. But I would start with children's comics. Don't start to read a comic that's maybe aimed at adults. Read children's comics because the pictures and the language give you a context. So you start to learn words. Have a partner. If you have a partner who's Japanese, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, or anything in between, that helps because you, this is someone you're emotionally invested in. And so you're, you're more likely to, to want to learn their language and communicate with them. I'm just saying in general, you know, most of us who have who've learned the language have had Japanese partners, girlfriends, boyfriends. Um, it helps if that's, if you're intending to speak Japanese with them, right? I mean, that helps. I'm not saying you use them for the language, but you know, if you're reluctant to say, you know, I don't want to find a Japanese partner because I have to learn the language, then there's your problem, right? You're, there's certain things about the language that you're resisting. So, I mean, if, if, if you like someone or you think, you know, I might want to date someone who's Japanese, but the only issue is language, then try. If there's other issues, <laughs> there's serious ones, then don't, don't just date someone for the language. Um, that helps. Um, for me, learning it was just having my family, meaning my host parents, around and just loving them and wanting to communicate with them, wanting them to understand, to understand me, wanting to understand them. Um, and then when I, uh, I'm a, I like writing things. So when I started dating um, in Japan, when I first came to Japan, I would write notes. This is back before the internet. So you write notes to people. So I was writing notes and I would ask my Japanese teacher how to write certain things. So I was kind of embarrassed, but I was like, how do I say I love you or I need you or I want to take you out or something like that. And they'd help me. So I mean, you know, um, Putting yourself in a situation where you have to communicate with people is key. So I said before, go to a network session, meet people, respond to them in Japanese, right? Or uh, just put yourself out there. There's really no shortcut that worked for me. It was just meeting people, wanting to communicate with them, making mistakes, learning from the mistakes, rinse and repeat. Last time I was in the, you mean the US? Last time I was in the US, I took my five girls. It was two years ago. Two years ago, 2016, three years ago now, I took them all to the U.S. to say, see grandma and grandpa and the family. So that was three years ago. I don't miss the U.S. as much as I used to. I talked to my I talked to my parents today on the phone using Skype. So, and my brother as well. So I don't miss them like that anymore. I'm 44 years old. I I have my family here, so I don't miss them the same way I used to. Um, I was in Canada last year or two years ago. I can't remember when my daughter, she's there with my, my wife's family, my 18 year old from a previous marriage is there with my wife, was there with my wife's family to go to high school um, in Toronto. So I was there for that. Um, but I don't go back to the States to sort of see family. I'm gonna go there this year, my older, my, sorry, older, <laughs> my younger brother's getting married, so I'll go there for that. But I don't get back to the States for you know, I've got to get back and reconnect to the States. I, I reconnect to the States through the news and my family and stuff like that. It always does feel different. It doesn't feel like home. It feels, certain things do feel like home. When I get to West Virginia and I get to the airport, or I see my parents or I, and my family home, et cetera, it feels like home. But the topics of conversation are different. You know, the, the smells are different. People drive everywhere. Um, it doesn't, it feels, there's a level of comfort there because I grew up there but it doesn't feel like home. I get home to Japan, like the, you know, it's funny though. When I was in Nigeria a year and a half ago with my family, we went to Nigeria, stayed with a, my best friend. He was, he's, he's Nigerian, he lives there. And he and I, you know, I visited Nigeria and Ghana. That felt like home. The moment I touched down in Nigeria, I was home. <laughs> my wife, was, she, 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 she was shocked because the moment I got there, I was, actually before I got there on the airplane from France to, to, to Lagos, 
I felt at home. I had never felt so comfortable in an alien place. And I celebrated my birthday there and I didn't want to leave. And we so want to go back there. So that's weird. That taught me something, that home isn't necessarily where you grew up. Home can be, something can click in your mind or genetically or something, you feel like you're at home. But I mean, I walked around Lagos and Abuja with a confidence I never had before. You know, it's a lot, there's a lot behind that, I think, too, getting back to Africa. And I don't, want to, I don't think we have time to even get into that. But after I left, and I organized this trip, a Black Professionals Tokyo trip to Nigeria and Africa, and a group of 10 of us went, including my family, all my kids, my, not all my kids, but my kids and my, my mother-in-law, and we all went. It was fantastic. It was home. And we can't wait to go back there, you know, maybe buy a home there and do business there. And I do business there now, but um, I'm having a meeting next week with some friends to talk about how we can get there. You know, it's, it was awesome. So America doesn't feel like home anymore. Uh, Japan feels like home, but I was shocked that Nigeria felt like home. And I went to Ghana too, and Ghana didn't feel the same way, but Nigeria, that felt like home. Oh yeah, I was worried. How, how was that experience? Well, they can probably tell you, and they'll probably be, they're black in Japan, right? They'll probably get an interview, you know, be on this series at some point, they can tell you their story. So I don't wanna speak for them, but as a parent, what I did see is, my oldest, my, 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 my oldest two children, my 20 year old, my 18 year old, my 20 year old felt very different. And so she, kids, all kids get picked on. So when she got picked on, she would internalize it like it must be because I'm half, which it may have been, but she doesn't know for a fact, right? People get picked on for many reasons and people will grab race or your gender or something because they, Maybe they like you or maybe they're intimidated by you or something like that, but no, no, no serious hazing, no serious hazing. But my daughter gave a speech, a 20 year old gave a speech when she was in high school for a speech contest. She spoke about how she felt marginalized until she started to say, you know what? I don't care what people think. I am Japanese and et cetera, et cetera. So even though I didn't see her getting bullied, she felt different. She felt oppressed by the culture. My 18 year old didn't feel oppressed by the culture actively, but because boys didn't try to ask her out like she saw with her other friends, she felt oppressed. She didn't feel like she was being recognized for who she was here in the circle she was in. Even though we traveled to the States a lot, I spent a lot of time with her. There was a part of her that felt different. And in Canada, she's enjoying it a great deal. She loves it there. Um, she misses Japan though. She wants to be here, but there was a part of her that said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not, as confident as I think I could be being in, in, in the States. And uh, my 16 year old, who's also half, she has a boyfriend, he's Japanese. I think I may have mentioned this Japanese kid, right? She doesn't feel as marginalized if you ask her, but maybe she does. I mean, I'm her father, you know, maybe she doesn't tell me, but I don't see the marginalization. I don't see her going through the kind of emotional trauma her, her, um, her, her other sisters did or felt. But the actual bullying, like the, I think my 18 year old actually bullied a, another kid at school when she was in elementary school, not realizing it. She really liked this friend and wanted to spend a lot of time with her. And she was being a little too pushy about spending time with this little girl. And the little girl felt bullied and like oppressed because she couldn't say no. <laughs> you know, she didn't want to spend so much time with my daughter. So my daughter was the bully. And I was like, whoa, my daughter's bullying this girl. And we resolved that and everything. But, um, um, yeah, I didn't see it, but I worried about it a lot. I wanted to send them to international school, but I didn't have the money. So I said, I'm sending them to local school, but if they wind up having trouble, I'm going to get them out of there. So they never had enough trouble to where it was, they were gonna leave. At one point, my 20 year old, when she was in elementary school, at the end of elementary school, junior high school, she didn't want to go to school. So her mother called me and I said, she's not going to school. And I said, okay, well, I, I got on the train early. I traveled all the way across Tokyo to get there in the morning, get her dressed, and if need be, carry her to school, because I'm her dad, she's going to go to school, but I also want to know what was wrong. And she wasn't being bullied, but the boys would stare at her, and she was thinking maybe they don't like me, and she was feeling, going through these teenage issues. But I wanted to be there to talk to her, to take her to school and say, what's going on? And there were teachers who were supporting her, so I, even though she may have felt bullied, I saw how much the teachers cared about her, and she did have friends. That said, she's okay. She's going through what teenagers go through, but if this continues, I'm gonna have to send her away. But it didn't, it didn't come to that, and even now, she enjoys being in Japan, for better or for worse. First of all, I'm, I'm reluctant to give parents advice, because 
<laughs> I'm a parent and we're irrational. We're connected to these children in such a way that sometimes reason isn't a part of it. Or we believe, you know, we, we're so tied into our kids and their success is so important to us that I can't really speak for another parent. But um, from my experience, one thing I've learned is you listen to your children. Watch them, listen to them. They're going to go through things you never went through and you're, you're not gonna have a frame of reference to sort of figure it out. But listen to them, you know, and, and be okay with failing. Try something, see if it works. Because I can't tell a parent to try something they don't believe in. I, no, I can, I don't want to. Because if something goes wrong, the parent's gonna feel so guilty and like, maybe I should have listened to myself. So try something. Um, if you can afford international school, send them. Just send them there. Um, but one thing I've found with my children who are black, the two youngest ones, their confidence is, it, it astounds me that you know, they, they can be, they feel a little bullied sometimes, but they love, their, love going to school, they have friends, they, they lose friends, they gain friends, They're, they just love it. And I'm like, wow, the resilience I learned from them is, is, is amazing. So we had those moments we were worried, let's send them away, but we watched their children and they love being at school, they love their friends, they love, they're not negative. So give your kids lots of love, um, be careful what you say because you may think the kids aren't watching. So love yourself, right? Don't, don't be negative about the Japanese in front of your children. Don't belittle the culture that kids internalize, that kind of thing. So in our home, we have Japanese people come and help us with our, you know, my wife has our baking business. They come and they help us. She sees people from all different countries just working together and, and getting along. You know, build them up with love, not just loving your children, but showing them love, showing them you loving one another or you loving other people. I mean, one of the things that I, I'm proud of is, you know, my, my second wife is involved in my children's life to some degree. They, my other young children, they, they know her because they, they know their older sister and stuff like that. So they know her and they see people getting along. And I think that makes a difference, you know, showing them, not just telling them you're beautiful, everyone's equal, but showing them that people can, you know, you make, like, here's an example. The reason I mentioned that example before is that your children may be angry at something. Someone picked on them. You'll say, fight kids or, you know, you know, fight back or whatever. But in a way, you're teaching your children that when you get angry, it's okay to give up on humans. It's okay to give up on humanity. You know, your anger makes you righteous, so to speak. And that's not always the case. Sometimes you have to overcome your anger and do a lot of things. So when they see an example of like, where people should have, based on what society tells you, should have been not getting along, should have been fighting, should be ripping each other's throats, they say, wait, we can overcome this. And I know the song, We Shall Overcome, I sing it sometimes to myself, or I play it on my guitar or whatever, but you have to show them that. And that is, what I intend to do, what I try to do. And I think that makes a big difference. You see people getting along that maybe people tell you you shouldn't. So when someone says that can't be done, that shouldn't be, you're like, no, it is. So it's like the, the faith thing I told you before is that someone's faith is based on something they've seen. They believe it because they've seen it. They've seen God in their life. They've seen this happen. They've seen the love of their parents. You can't tell them their parents don't love them. They felt it, right? So when my children have seen that people can get along, when they've seen that race or gender is not an issue, they've seen it, they felt it, no one can take that from them, at least not easily, right? So just love your children, show them love, show them resilience, show them that they can be themselves. They can, they can be confident, you know, it, it, then you're doing your children a service that will allow them to overcome things that are going to happen you never expected. Because my kids go through things I never went through. Ever. And I don't know, I couldn't tell them from experience what to do. How old are your two youngest stars? Eight and six. Well, I mean, we, well, we, my wife does. I, I, I help, but I mean, it's really her drive. She sort of homeschools the children as well in Japanese and English. They do kumon and stuff like that. Um, my youngest, the youngest of the two, went to Hoyokuen really young, like two. Her Japanese is flawless. She fits in, she, she loves Japanese food, natto, we joke like she's Japanese, she's, she fits in. Nothing could really make her feel, they could say you're not Japanese, you're this or that, she doesn't care. She loves the country, she loves the people, she just fits in. My eight year old went to preschool a little later, so her Japanese development was delayed, but she's getting into it now. And there were times we thought international school, we can't 
he's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. But they do it. Your kids are resilient. It's like they're so awesome. Kids are so awesome. They they can just overcome things we cannot. And then they're sensitive to things that we would never notice. Right. So um, let them go watch your child, talk to your child, engage your child, ask, about, ask, ask them, ask them, ask them about their day. Ask them about their day. Um, I don't speak English much during the week. <laughs> so ask them about their day. Just watch them and listen to them. Right. If you say they look a little down. You say, do you want to go to school? If they say no, I'm saying you don't let them go. But then there's a problem. Why don't you want to go? Right. Or you say, do you have friends? And they're like, yes, I do. I said, well, then, you know, we've told our kids a lot of times that just be happy. If your kids, kids don't want to play with you, have fun playing by yourself. Kids will come. And it's true. That's what happens. You know, trying to be, you know, when negative things happen, as I said before, it'll sabotage you, it'll derail you. And if you let it, it will. The world will make you its slave rather than you making the world a tool for your success and happiness, right? So you have to teach that to your children. You can't just tell them. You have to show them. So I know when I go home tonight, I try not to complain about work, um, spend time with them, share with them my day, uh, and just be real. You know, be real with them as much as I can. I mean, they're only eight and six. I can't say certain things, but just show them, you know, that resilience. Like, you know, if I'm talking to someone, be careful the language I use. Yeah, just you, you have to live by example. And we can't always do it. I'm not sorry. I don't do it perfectly. I'm just giving advice based on things that I've done and where I failed as well. Working for a payday is, working for payday, first of all, is just the best job I've ever had. Okay. And it's, it's for the reasons of, I mentioned before about being able to feel like I'm helping the, the country. And potentially, I mean, this service could be used in, in Africa, right? To help, you know, uh, make things cashless and provide services to people all over the world. So I can see that potential. So just that motivation makes this job fun. Um, but also because it's a startup and startups go through phases, you know, where it's like a small family, then it m matures and people sort of move apart and the company's direction changes. So, you know, people start to leave and quit and motivation goes like this. You have these waves and stuff. So we're going through those. But at the same time, from a business standpoint, you see it growing. You see so much, especially working at a startup, you can see where every action has a result on the business, has a result on the, the employees, has a result on our customers, has a result on our bottom line, right? That's awesome. I mean, who doesn't want to be, I mean, it's why you have children, right? You, you, you contribute to their lives, you see a result. It's motivating, right? So having a job like that is, is great. And I'm really thankful that I didn't give up on my career because when I was working and I was changing jobs, people were saying, well, you, you know, you don't, shouldn't change jobs. You know, no one's going to trust you or believe you, you know, whatever. And I believed them. A part of me did. I said, am I really? And then I wound up getting this job, which is my, you know, I have days where I, I'm like, I don't want to go to work. We all have them, right? But I love this job because I, I think it's a, it's a culmination of everything I've been doing, right? But um, I could have taken jobs in, that were more corporate, meaning, uh, more HR, more standard, bigger companies, that type of thing. But I don't think I would have been as happy. Um, probably have more free time, but not as happy. So it's work, great to work at um, You know, you see these things. We have advertisements. You know, it's great to see these advertisements on YouTube and things of that nature, things on TV, things in the train. Things happen quickly at a startup. That's fun. But the negative things about startups, and it's not, I, I don't see it as a negative. It's cool with me. But the negatives are a lot of things aren't defined. There's a lot of things that aren't defined. And if you don't take ownership, it's not going to change. If you don't take a risk, maybe even risking getting, losing your job by telling someone something they don't want to hear in a friendly way, um, things don't change. They don't. You have to take a lot of ownership. You have to deal with a lot of ambiguity in a, in a, in a startup. And if that's not you, you want to work in an environment that's sort of defined. You're not someone who's who's confident taking ownership and, 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 and really communicating on a daily basis with different types of people in different areas, a startup can be really hard to. So that's the negatives, I think, of the job. When I interview people, people who leave, it's like, it's changing. I'm like, yeah, it is. Or there's things aren't defined. I'm like, no, they're not. You know, and you hope that they go find what they want. So payday is a, what we call a, a after, uh, in English, that's sort of like pay, um, it's like a re replacement of cash on delivery. 
Hey, Kogasan. <laughs> That's where we are. Um, it's, it's like uh, cash on the, it's a re re replacement of cash on delivery. So um, it solves the problem of when you go online to a merchant and you want to buy something, right? Um, in Japan, you could use your credit card. But if you don't know the merchant, or it's your first time using it, most Japanese don't want to use their credit card. So they use what's called cash on delivery. Cash on delivery means that, you know, cash on delivery. When it comes to your house, you pay for it, which means that if you're not home, you don't get the product. And if you don't pay for it, the merchant doesn't get it. So there's a problem with cash on delivery for the buyer and the seller. So what we do, because we have the licenses, you know, the, the certain types of licenses to actually, you know, loan money, give credit, that type of thing, credit licenses. When you use Payday, you don't give a credit card, nothing. You just give your email address, your phone number. A text is sent to you with a four-digit code. You put that in the, in the site and you, you purchased it through the merchant. You get a bill at the end of the month or it's automatically deducted from your, your whole bill for the month is deducted out of your bank account so that the merchant gets paid and your product's gonna be delivered whether or not you're home or not. Uh, Klarna is a company in Europe that sort of started this. So it's, it's, it's a model that's already existed in the world. And so what that does in principle is allows people to feel safe. Their credit card information isn't going to get stolen. So PayPal sort of serves, does that kind of thing, but you still have to give a credit card, right? Payday, you don't need that. So we have a technique to sort of underwrite based on that and you know, assess risk and that type of thing. So that's how we do it. So tell me what you book. Making it in Japan, yeah, Insider's so. Journey to Success. Yeah, Sorry, so I didn't come up with that title. <laughs> okay, well, I wanted to start a business back in 98. I was working, you know, I finished working for the company that's written in the book, and I wanted to start a business because I wanted to help people. And I felt that corporations sometimes there's too many layers to really touch the, the clients and customers. So I wanted to start a business. And I felt a gentleman I knew from college um, gave me the idea to maybe start a business, write a book to sort of kick off the business. And it would be a consulting business, giving people advice about Japan. So he found a publicist for me and um, asked me to write a book. So I was sort of contractually obligated to write it. So I, was, I had to. So people ask you, how'd you write a book? I said, I had no choice. So every weekend I'd write about three chapters and I just wrote what I knew. So I wrote about working in Japan and I wrote the book. Um, I had a friend of mine edit it for me, uh, a, lady, a young lady I dated in high school. She was black. She edited her school magazine and she was a writer and a, and, a, and a poet. And so I had her edit, help me edit the book. She edited it for me. And we, um, we just published, self-published it. Um, when it was published, I gave a talk at the Harvard Faculty Club because, you know, being a Harvard alum, I did Harvard Faculty Club. I did talks at like um, different universities. So the Harvard Faculty Club, in the, so I went to the States. I traveled to the U.S. to do talks. Um, and be interviewed on the radio about my book and my experience in Japan. So I just wrote about what I knew and I wanted people to sort of understand. And I, did, I don't think in the book, it's funny, later on people said, you never mentioned you were black. People didn't realize I was black until they saw the back cover. And they said, was that by design? I said, no, it wasn't. I was just describing what I went through. And in the day, I'm not thinking about that, but consciously I wasn't. But I was writing this story, I realized that I was so caught up in trying to understand the country and the culture that it, re it rarely dawned on me what I looked like, unless I looked in the mirror or someone said something. And rarely did anyone say anything. They would say, you're foreign. They didn't say I was black. So when I'm writing the story, I mentioned I'm foreign all the time. Actually, the title of the book was going to be, I think the guy, one of the guys you interviewed said he had a book called Guy Kokujin. That was going to be my title for the book. When I heard him say that, I said, there's no new idea under the sun. You know, his book was written before mine, I believe. But I was thinking the same thing, guy kokujin, and use the same kanji for black for koku. But um, I wrote the book and I realized that I, I had just, coincidentally, just wrote a story that anyone can easily just jump into and sort of uh, maybe um, uh, sympathize or empathize with the, with, the, with the character, so to speak. Um, but I thought, if they're gonna look at the book and see the back cover, they know I'm black anyway, whatever. Um, but yeah, that was kind of cool to write that book and say I've written a book. That's, I'm proud of that. Uh, so that was cool. That was really interesting. But I found that, you know, it's, it's not just about writing the book. It's because I can tell people I've written a book. They don't care. You know, it's, it's more along the lines that I feel the confidence is given me. Right. 
it's, um, or as well as the, 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 the impact it's had on people. Someone who'd read it and said, you know, it helped me. That's, that's what it's about. Right. Yeah, I think if you want to work in Japan, I mean, I, I talk about concepts of like us versus them. I think if you're trying to deal with difference, I think it's a good book. If you're living anywhere where you feel different, I think the book sort of talks about the things. Okay, the principle is that in order to succeed, you need people to help you. You need help. And people will help you for various different reasons. They'll help you because they want to. They'll help you because they're using you. they help you because you're interesting. But occasionally you'll find people who just will want to help you just because it's what they do. And we, none of us succeed alone. So how do you build bridges? How do you build relationships? How do you build trust? That's what I think the book can teach you. Because naturally humans think us versus them. So how do you get them not to see you as them? Listening to them, you know, understanding them, being able to make them laugh, being able to reaffirm them, right? So when you go drinking with your boss, you're reaffirming that he's right, so to speak. Even though he may not be aware of it, you're reaffirming his righteousness. And then you start to build a bridge, you build influence with people. So I think if you want to come, if you want to deal, I don't say be successful in Japan, everyone's journey is going to be different. Some will be English teachers, some will be executives, some will be expats or whatever. But trying to deal with difference, I think the book can help you because in chapter 12, which I remember this because it was, if I, if I remember what chapter it was because it was a real pivotal in my life. My senpai was so abusive that it wasn't until we were in Las Vegas for a business trip and I hadn't seen him in a while and my CEO and, and my director were berating him, berating him about how he's not doing a good job with our ventures in the States. He goes, you should be more like Henry. And when I heard that, I said, what? He's been telling me my whole, my whole time here, I'm not good enough. Everyone's laughing at me, everyone wants me to quit. But he's the one. That taught me something too. When someone's abusing you, sometimes it's not you, it's them. But sometimes it is you, but sometimes it's them. And I heard that and I said, you know what? I'm just gonna keep trying my best. They said, and the thing wasn't that they believed in me. They, they told him why. They said, even though Henry makes mistakes, he keeps trying. That's key. Just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you failed. You've learned, keep moving, right? And that changed my life. So I actually, at that moment, I said, you know what? I'm gonna leave this company. I'm gonna try what I wanna do sort of thing. So that's why I remember the chapter because it was hard to write because it was such a, a pivotal moment in my young life. But that's what I learned from that. And I think anyone reading the book about, you know, have faith in yourself. You know, don't give up on what you are. Give up on your dream, because sometimes your dreams cannot be your dreams. You may be, those are your parents' dreams or your wife's dreams or someone else's dreams. But who you are as a person, if you're someone who likes to talk to people, you like someone who likes to try new things, don't give up on that. I think you can learn from the book because that, that experience built my faith to not give up on who I am as a person. If you're interested, as I said, uh, about you know just learning about difference and having to, how do you cope? How do you, uh, you know, embed yourself in a different culture and come to understand and have it embrace you? I think the book would be useful, uh, be very helpful. It's called you know, uh, "Making It in Japan: Insider's Journey." You can find it on Amazon in digital copies. No more hard copies left. You can find it Amazon anywhere in the world and uh, order it. Hopefully, it'll, you'll find it helpful. Japan can take something alien and make it their own, right? Give an example from history. Democracy. They didn't have it. They took it, made it their own, right? Militarism, fascism, you know, they took it, made it their own. Um, cars, technology, um, capitalism, socialism, they make it work in their own sort of way. They could take things and make them work. I mean, there's problems, there always will be. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's perfect, but they can take something and just really make it work and improve it perhaps even. Um, and I think that we, there's something to learn from that, like things like certain concepts, like one of the things that, being racially, talking about my own programming in America, there's this thing I think most black folks in America will relate to is when we see like extreme sports, a certain generation perhaps, extreme sports, we always joke, that's a white people thing, right? We joke about that, like parachuting and, and bungee jumping and all that kind of stuff. We associate that with whiteness, right? Um, for better or for worse. But the irony is that it's not necessarily a white thing. It just happens to be social economically. Certain people can't do these sports because they cost money or whatever. And so there's the number of people who happen to do it look a certain color or whatever. But the thing is that, um, you know, since I've been in Japan, I've bungee jumped. I've done things that I ne might necessarily have done in, this, in, in the States. So I'm learning to sort of take things on as my own, you know, like playing the guitar. Uh, you know, going out there and being 
feeling entitled sometimes, like walking into a room and not feeling afraid that someone's judging me because I can do it in Japan because a part of me could just say, at least for a time, I could say, I'm not Japanese. I don't need to worry about what they think. And I just walk into a room and just say, I'm here type of thing. So just trying to learn to own things that maybe aren't you because maybe you can take it and find something from that, make it your own or find something from that that'll help you. So Japan, Japanese do that really well. You see Japanese learning to do reggae dances or Jamaican dances and things of that nature, taking parts of culture. I mean, there's, I mean, in like Jamaican parties in Japan, the DJs, have you ever seen the DJs, right? They're just like, some of them are really awesome, right? They've taken something and they've given it a Japanese spin. Maybe a little better in certain ways, worse in others perhaps, but they can really take something and make it their own and, and, and improve upon it, so to speak. They take appropriation to the next level, you know, they, they, just, they just own it. One thing I find about Japanese who are into something, when they find something, they, they're really into it. They don't really say it's Japanese. They go, it's foreign. So they don't really appropriate it in that way. They have this value, they probably have an interest in the original culture it comes from, but they, so they can take things and just re-engineer it in really amazing ways. Okinawa. I was always scared of going to Okinawa because I heard about the, I mean, I didn't go to Okinawa until I was in Japan 20 years, I think. I didn't go, I was scared because I heard about the, mili the rapes and the militaries there. And you know, you think about racism in Japan, you think they're going to see me as a black guy and they're going to protest me in the streets. You know, the news can really derail you. I went to Okinawa and had a fabulous time. And I was there working and I met all different types of people and I went to all different types of places. And you talk about just kind and nice island folk awesome. Uh, Nagasaki. Nagasaki is nice. Nagasaki is a wonderful little sort of coastal, not coastal town, but sort of coastal town. You like it. It's very quaint. It's very small. People are friendly and nice. It has the, you know, the Peace Park. It has the museum for the, regarding the atomic bomb, etc. Nagasaki is a wonderful town, beautiful food, lots of, lots of international exposure. China, Europe, etc. You'll just walk around going, wait a second, there's, there's a little, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing from that perspective. Those are really nice places to go. Um, I was really shocked with Okinawa. I really enjoyed it a great deal. Uh, it depends on what your interests happen to be, to be honest. You can go skiing in Sapporo or Hokkaido or go skiing in, in Nagano. I don't ski. I've snowboarded a couple times. And the best thing is to get to the top of Mount Fuji. Climb Mount Fuji. Going down is awful. It sucks. I've done it five times. I don't know why I've done it because every time I go down it, I'm thinking I'm never doing this again. Going down is going up. You're like, I'm going to get to the top. But on a clear day, if you can get to Mount Fuji and see the sunrise and be above the clouds, it's beautiful. And one time I climbed so that I reached the top late at night. So I saw all the stars in the Milky Way in the sky. I saw the moon just full in the sky. You know, it's amazing, so, and it's so. And I say you do that in probably any other country as well, but it's convenient to get to the top of Mount Fuji. Take a bus, you stroll up. So the convenience of getting to these amazing places is what I think really adds to the experience. Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby, uh, because I mean I could say anyone historically. I could, I could come up with something, make something up, but I'm a comic book guy, and Jack Kirby was the, my hero. He wrote comic books I could relate to and the pictures inspired me, et cetera. But also given that whole idea, I mean, he's the reason I smoke cigars. It's Jack Kirby, right? He did character, as a kid, he and Stan Lee did, created the Black Panther, right? You know what I'm saying? And the, 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 the Black Racer from the New Gods comic book. I thought to myself, this Jewish guy, about five foot five, whatever, real short fellow, did these characters, you know, Sergeant Fury, and he, at the time, you know, there weren't any black characters. So I said, this man, this is, I said, wow, he, he, it inspiring. He said, you know, you, you're not just your race, right? You can do things for people, whether you intended to or not, regardless, right? And I'd like to learn about what made him who he was. What made him think about, I'm gonna make a black character. He did this, you know, this comic called like, you know, black romance, because he and Joe Simon did romance comics in the 50s, so he thought in the 70s, you know, blackness was it, was in, right? So he thought about doing it, and, but he, he's, he's an old Jewish cat from New York, and so some, some famous people didn't like what he was writing because it didn't seem to be genuine, but he was trying, you know, he was trying to 
you know, he was a storyteller and he wanted to highlight and showcase people from all over and different things. I mean, Big Barda, you had a woman who was a, you know, an alpha woman who was feminine, but a, a superhero, right? I mean, just the imagination to sort of create new worlds, better worlds, right? That, to have that, given all the challenges he went through, et cetera, I wanna be that person. I wanna create new worlds for people. Jack Kirby, man, when he died in 1994, I said, damn it, but I got to meet Stanley, even though being a Jack Kirby fan, I can sometimes you know, hate on Stanley, but Stanley was a great man too. And I got to meet him when he came to Tokyo Comic Con. I said, I didn't get to see my heroes, Jack Kirby, but I got close enough to him by, going, by meeting Stan Lee. But I'd love to meet Jack Kirby. I mean, I wouldn't give anything to meet Jack Kirby, but that's one of the things I really wish I could do because he was an, you know, we're all of us, when we go out there and try to meet people and try to get a job or whatever it is, we're trying to create a world, a world for ourselves or whatever, and it's hard. But this person created, even if only on paper, and that takes a certain type of mind, takes a certain type of commitment to people, a commitment to yourself, a commitment to belief, to faith. I want that. I think I have that, and I could have learned so much from him, I think. Because he uses it in art, I use it in, 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 in the business world, or in, in, in volunteering and stuff like that. My favorite comic book? <laughs> my favorite comic book is The New Gods. Dark Side's my favorite villain. Um, because he created a mythology. I mean, you read, I love mythology, like Homer and the Odyssey, and Jack Kirby and these guys, they created a mythos. And it's like, oh, the way things could be, the way things could be epic, you know, it's something to strive towards, you know, you're sort of, you know, it's all fantasy, of course, but I just loved it. It's, it's, it's cheesy, the, 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 it's cheesy and corny, but man, Jack could create some stuff. And it, it just, it's inspired. I go home sometimes, I still read the books to my kids, and my wife, <laughs> She's, she's like, she knows the answer. Who's your favorite person? It's like Jack Kirby. I mean, don't get me wrong, Abraham Lincoln is great and everything like that, and Martin Luther King. Of course, I would love to sit down with him, you know, and talk to him about things. Don't get me wrong. But as it applies to my life, every great person, I think, who I am I'm inspired by, tried to create a world, a better world for people. Jack Kirby created many different ones. He has spoke to so many different people. When you see people who love Jack Kirby's work, they're from all different backgrounds, all different cultures, all different ages, everything. I said, that spoke to people. So there's something there. I wanna to speak to people, so to speak. And um, so yeah, that's who I'd wanna meet. I got a job in Japan, written in the book, Mitani. Then I got another job making three times the amount. So I went from like 20 grand to 60 grand, right? I thought everything was great. There's more money than I ever needed. My first daughter was born then. I thought I was happy. And I was, to a degree. Um, but then I got another offer for another company about three years later, and I went to that company. And I was making even more money, and I was happy. But then about a year later, I got another offer to be head of IT for a company, being paid about 50% more. And I liked the guy who interviewed me. I liked my boss. I still liked him. Uh, I still like him. He was a good guy. But I took the job because of the money. Now, don't get me wrong, because I took that money, I could ask for more at the next jobs, okay? So I'm not saying I made a mistake in the context of looking at the results, so to speak, but I reg after I took the job, I think I regretted it every day. I regret it every day. And when I sit with people who are looking about, the I think about the career, I don't tell them what not to do. You have to make your mistakes to learn. You have to make your mistakes to learn. That's the only way people learn, I think. You get, give them information, but then they have to live it on themselves, on themselves, right? But I took this job and it was a year and a half. I wasn't ready to manage people. I wasn't ready to lead. I wasn't ready to listen. I was going through a divorce. I was, I just wasn't ready for life and what was, what was coming. I, I, I hadn't anyone coach me. I learned a lot about the need for coaching, the need for support, the need for friends through that. And um, my advice would be if you can, no matter what you're doing, have some people around you you trust, whose decisions you may listen to. Um, because sometimes you can get so blinded by whether it's money or by stress, because I thought, you know, if I'm getting divorced, if I can make more money, I can buy a home and my family can be safe, even if our marriage implodes or, you know, or um, if I get more money, I can drink myself under the table because I'm, I'm, I feel depressed because, you know, this isn't, why is this happening, the type of thing having people around who love you, 
and who know you is really key anywhere you go. So no matter where you go, the key to Japan or anything like that, is build a relationship with people. Building a relationship with someone. But don't go in there saying, I'm gonna build a relationship, you know, give me something. That never works. Well, they'll say never. It doesn't really work out. But really trying to realize that by you recognizing someone, they'll recognize you just as a reflex, you know, usually. You know, just go out there and build a network, build a community of people who are, who will just build you up because the world will want to knock you down and not because the world's evil. Just people have their own agendas. People are people. And I'm telling you, man, if I had had an older man my age, when I was 24, 25, I had someone who was in their mid-40s who had been going through what I went through and could just have, and I trusted, my life would be, I, wouldn't think, I don't know if it'd be better, but it'd be different. I would have made some different decisions and I think I'd have less regrets in my life. You know, but I'm happy with what I have now. I'm so happy, my children, my family, whatever. But at the time, you know, that was rough. So, um, yeah, build people. So that's why I'm really, literally, when I said the other time about, you know, I'll do my best to try to help people. I mean, I don't have so much time and so much, you know, energy, so to speak. But, uh, you know, you know, there's times where you're sitting there and you're like, this isn't worth it. Let me jump in front of a train, right? That happens, to me at least. I've had those moments in the past, not recently, but in the past. And if I could prevent someone from feeling that way, because think what would happen to my family, my kids live without a father. I don't want anyone to, to, kids to grow up without a dad. I had a dad, it was awesome. I had a mom, it was awesome. I don't want anyone to go through that. So if it takes me a little bit of extra effort to help someone from stepping in front of a train or in front of a car, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. I want to at least. The biggest fight, and it's a funny thing, and this is just a funny story, funny story. The biggest fight I ever had with my wife, the biggest fight we've ever had, was after the major earthquake in 311. And I think someone made a comment, they should interview my wife, and you should, she's awesome. Um, she'll tell you these stories and the different, get a different spin on it. Maybe I'm not so nice, who knows. But the biggest fight we ever had was, it was 311, earthquake had happened. We traveled down to Osaka to stay with my host family. Um, because my company said, you can, don't have to come into work, you know, radiation, fears, you know, you can not come into the office. So I went down to Osaka, stayed with them, and then I'm seeing on TV about this, what they're, how, how they're trying to address the radiation, these helicopters dumping water and these people suffering. And I remember saying, I have to be there. This is my country. Even though I wasn't Japanese at the time, I said, this is my country. These people need help. Something's going wrong and the government's not doing what they're doing. This is a joke. I remember saying to my wife, when we had just had a daughter born, my eight-year-old had just been born, I took another one of my daughters from my second marriage. Her mother said, you can take her too. Take her down away from this radiation. So it was my 18-year-old, my eight-year-old, well, they were younger then. This is ten, almost 10 years ago. And I said, I have to go. I have to help. And she looked at me like I was crazy. She's like, you have a family to take care of. I need you. I said, but the country needs me. The world needs me. If we all focus on our families only, then... Who am I to say, get angry when someone like Trump gives favors to his family? I'm not saying Trump's an evil man or something. I'm not, I'm not talking politically. I'm just saying in general, people say, why are you helping your family? You know, why are you only helping your cousin, right? I said, I don't, I, in my worldview, I'm like, I, I can't s criticize someone if I'm not willing to do something differently. And she spoke and, I, and I, I was so angry with her and I was so mad and I told her that. But she was, you know, she was right in her own way. She just had a baby. I'm her, I'm her husband. I, she loves me more than anyone else in the world. I can't abandon her. But in my heart, I wanted to help these people. And still to this day, I'm like, why didn't I go? But I made that decision. So that desire to want to help people is who I am, right? And it will kill me probably because it stresses you because you, you put yourself out there for people and people sometimes abuse that and it, it happens. But if I can help, I will. If I can't, Hey, I'm just giving you that story, meaning it's not because I don't want to, it's because I can't. So that's just a story explaining me as a person. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't ready to get on the train and go up to Fukushima and <laughs> gee, money Christmas, what's wrong with me? But uh, yeah, yeah, that's about it. So divorce, man, man, man. If I knew then what I know now, that's all I can say. Uh, so. When I was getting divorced, or before I was getting divorced, I told my wife, 
we talked about, you know, I was unhappy, right? I was unhappy for various reasons, some good, some valid, and some invalid, you know, looking back, right? Um, I felt hurt by just things that had happened. I was like, her culture, things that she had to do because of her culture offended me, offended me. And I said, this person is not on my team. This person doesn't see the world the way I do. And it really poisoned me towards her. It happened, and I, I don't think there's any way to have avoided that, to be honest. But um, when we were getting divorced, she was like, she didn't want to, because she loved me, I think. And I loved her. Um, so we had our moments where we would fight, and we had moments where, you know, she would go home, and we had moments where, you know, I thought to myself, I'm gonna lose my children. But um, what usually happens is, at least at the time, this is almost 20 years ago, is, the wife gets the children, right? Usually the wife gets the children. Um, or the, 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 what do you say, the partner that has been wronged gets the children. Let's put it that way, right? And when you get divorced, they want you to determine who's the wrong person, who was, who was wronged, right? And even though I was moving on in my life, I was like, you know what? This isn't gonna work, I'm gonna move on. And I, and I, I wound up living with the woman who originally became my second wife. Um, no one was really wrong. We had this conversation. I didn't, you know, we didn't wrong each other. It just, it just happened, right? Um, so I was worried about losing my kids. We went to family court and, you know, I sit with them. They tell me what my wife wants and I tell them what I want and they tell my wife and we're not in the room at the same time. And, you know, they told me, I remember they telling me that you know, based on what you make, you should be paying this. And I said, but do I get to see my kids? What's my guarantee to see my kids? And they were like, well, your kids love you. And there's no guarantee. I'm like, well, I'm not agreeing to anything until I can see my kids. So this went on for a long time. And in the meanwhile, I would go see my kids. I would talk to my ex-wife. I remember I had, I had already moved on in my life. I'd already had my, my second wife. We weren't married, but we had a child. And I remember actually having my child meet her sisters when I'd have them on the weekend, right? I would do that because I said, I'm, the world's telling me, trying to move me and my wife apart, moving the whole, my, me and my family apart, trying to, you know, because even though we were unhappy, the world tells you if someone's wronged you, you've got to cut them, you've got to, you've got to, you know, negative people, get them out of your life. The world's telling me to break up my family, even though it's breaking up anyway, to break it even more. You know, it, my anger is telling me these kind of things. So I was trying to build bridges because I could feel myself naturally trying to destroy them. My own ignorance about what life is, what love is, was making my marriage fall apart, right? So everything's sort of bringing us apart and I'm thinking, I've gotta do something to bring us together and the kids don't hate each other. The kids would meet each other and they, and so it's funny, my first wife saw this. And I remember once, it really got to the point even before my divorce, we could actually all, my child from my second, would wanna become my second marriage and my kids from my first marriage and my first wife could sit down and eat together. And when that happened, I said, something's right. I'm doing something right. I don't know what it is. People would make me feel terrible for getting divorced. Something's wrong with you, et cetera. I said, you know what? Maybe something is wrong with me. But my kids know each other. We love each other. We don't yell and fight all the time. It might not be right with a capital R, but it's not completely wrong either, right? So I was lucky. I was really lucky because of just something. Maybe it's the right woman, maybe it was the right approach to take, maybe just the stars in the sky. But it worked. It worked. Um, so I've heard horror stories, but I've never, she's never taken the kids from me. She's never threatened to take them from me, at least not seriously. We've had fights and stuff, but even to this day, you know, like today, my 20 year old graduated. It was me and my ex-wife sitting next to each other, watching our daughter graduate and talking about, you know, we didn't talk about money, we didn't fight at all. You know, she's my friend. You know, we, we love each other as far as being divorced people 20 something years can, be, can love one another, but we respect each other and we try to do our best, so to speak. But um, a lot of work, I said, there's no shortcut. I had to not only overcome my own ignorance that got me into the situation of being divorced, I had to also overcome my own ego that wanted me to just tear it apart and be righteous and try to take my kids from her and it worked. My, girl, my daughter has graduated from college and I got to be in her life She's 20 years old, that's drinking age. A week ago, me and her for the first time were drinking together and throwing darts in a bar. And I said, yes. You know, all those times someone told me I was wrong for getting divorced or you're a bad person. 
my children love me and I can spend time with them and I respect, I can hold them and hug them. They can tell me whatever they want, but my life works, so I'm not gonna beat myself up over it. Yeah, so yeah, so, it, but anyway, I've had friends who've lost their children who are still fighting for their kids and my advice to them is, you know, you just, just do your best. You know, try to not hate your partner. The world's telling them to hate you. Their culture's telling them to hate you. And by you hating them back, it just reinforces it, right? It's hard and it's not easy. So guys like myself and other guys who have been divorced, come to us, we'll, we'll be there for you. We'll, we'll drink with you, we'll smoke cigars with you to help you cope with the pain of not seeing your children. Because I had those weekends too, I was frightened and stuff. Just, I'm here, guys are here, women will be here to help you cope with this. So you're not alone. Find me online. Want to find me online, Seals Improvement Seminars, send a text about something you may want me to, to talk about. I'll do a video. So Seals Improvement Seminars, LinkedIn, Facebook, and of course my book, Making It in Japan, you can find on Amazon. And if it helps you or you have any additional questions based on that, let me know and I'll hook you up with Black Professionals Tokyo or any Professionals Tokyo and meetups and uh, hopefully help you on your way to whether it's here in Japan or elsewhere. We can help you. If our community can help you, why not? Thank you so much for watching. If you or someone you know would like to be featured, send us a message through our Facebook page or Instagram at the Black XJP or via our website, blackxjp.com. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.